Well, we are continuing our series. Our summer series is through the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is written uh, by John through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a message from Jesus to John to the church. And the church that they're writing to in the book of Revelation is a church that is under, as I mentioned last week, extreme opposition. Not only are they facing opposition from Rome, they're facing internal opposition. The, the harder it gets, the more persecution that comes their way, they start to see people flee and abandon, even internally, and turn on one another. So they are facing opposition from without and from within. And Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, inspires John to write this letter. How do you live in the midst of opposition? How do you live in the midst of persecution? How do you live in the midst of a world that is being turned upside down, faithful to your calling, faithful to what God has called you to? And there's so much relevance, as we've been able to see every week, between the churches that were established 2,000 years ago and our church right here in North America, our church right here in South Florida, and even our church right here, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, every week saying, God, through your infinite wisdom, 2,000 years ago, you inspired this guy by the name of John to write something that's so applicable even to us today because the word of God is living and active. And so uh, we are continuing our series this week by looking at the church of Laodicea. Every church that we've read about the last few weeks has received either rebuke or they've been commended. Every church has been commended. Even if they received rebuke, Jesus still delivers a commendation to the church, except for one, the church of Laodicea. It is the only church that does not receive the commendation of Jesus. It's the church we're gonna read about this morning. The wealthiest church in all of Asia Minor, the wealthiest church, the church that had more resources, more things, more possessions than any of the other churches in Asia Minor is the one church that receives no commendation from Jesus, only rebuke. Revelation chapter three, verse 14. Revelation chapter three, verse 14 through 20. To hear the word of God. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you're neither hot, cold, nor hot. Would that you would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve to anoint your eyes, so that you might see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. The thought of spitting something out of your mouth is not the most pleasant picture that we can receive today. The thought of spitting something out of your mouth is not the most pleasant image that we want to have in the context of a worship service. But I didn't say it, Jesus did. Jesus says that I am so repulsed and this church, Laodicea, makes me so nauseated that it makes me want to spit you out of my mouth. Some translations even go a little further and they talk about this idea of vomiting, right? I want to vomit you out of my mouth or spew you out of my mouth. The idea for the church of Laodicea is that they were so repulsive to Jesus that Jesus says that it's like tasting something and being so repulsed by it, I want to spit it out of my mouth. So nauseated. 
by the thought of the church of Laodicea. Now, I am somebody who values and understands the importance of good PR, and I cannot think of a worse PR move than for the church of Laodicea be known as the church that is spit out of the mouth of Jesus. This is not the church that is, has a great music program. This is not a good ch- a church that has great preaching or teaching or a good music or good children or youth or missions. This church will now be known throughout all of church history as the church that is spit out of the mouth of Jesus. As I said at the beginning, this is the wealthiest church. The church that had more resources and more provisions than any other churches in Asia Minor. And they would forever be known as the church that Jesus spits out of their mouth. They were a church that had grown idle. They are a church that had grown different, indifferent to the things of God. They are a church that had become apathetic to the things of God. The church of Laodicea is a story of a bride that is bored with their husband. And Jesus is coming back for them. So what can we learn this morning about the church of Laodicea and what does it have to do with our church context here at Coral Ridge. Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that this is a church that is sick, right? This is a church that is illness. Obviously, if you're causing Jesus to want to spit you out of their mouth, they are sick, they are impure, they are, there is something seriously wrong with this church. But what is the symptoms? How do we know that this church is sick? What is the illness? What is the symptom of the illness? Well, we find it in verse 15 and 16. Jesus says, I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot, would that you were cold or hot. So because you are what? Lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. You see, the symptoms of this sick church in Laodicea is that they had grown lukewarm. And Jesus says, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot nor cold. Now to understand what is going on in Jesus's description with that symptom of being lukewarm, this is the lukewarm church, we have to understand a little bit about what was going on here 2,000 years ago. I, like you, might have grown up thinking that the idea of lukewarm was somehow the midway point between totally rejecting Jesus, being cold to God, or being hot, being on fire, being passionate and zealous for the gospel. That's what it means to be hot. And so what Jesus is saying here, at least I used to think Jesus was saying, I'd almost rather you totally abandon the gospel, reject God, than somehow live in this in-between state of being um, totally rejected rejecting the gospel and being on fire for the gospel. Well, it's, under, it's important for us to understand what is going on here in the church of Laodicea. As I mentioned in the beginning, this church was wealthier than all the other churches in Asia Minor. They had arenas and auditoriums and centers, and it was an incredible um, place of Uh, trade and wealth and riches in uh, the region at the time. But there was one thing they lacked. They lacked their own water supply. And because they lacked their own water supply, they had to depend on two surrounding cities, two nearby cities to get their water. They had, to re- they had to rely on the city to the north on top of the mountain named Colos, in which they would receive cold water from. The, the Colos was on top of the mountain and the water would pour down the mountain and it would go into Laodicea. And the other city was Heropolis. And Heropolis was known for having these amazing warm medicinal springs and Laodicea would have um, water piped in from both cities, the cold water and the hot water. Why? Because the cold water was refreshing and it was pure from the pure mountain stream and it was refreshing. And the warm water was good for soothing and for medicinal purposes. But the problem was when the water from the cold water and the hot water, by the time it reached Laodicea, what happened? It became lukewarm. And if you understand anything about lukewarm water 2,000 years ago, by the time it became lukewarm, it became full, filled with all types of impurities and bacteria, and they would say that you would taste it, and you could taste the impurities and the bacteria, and it would make you want to spit it out of your mouth. And so what Jesus is saying here, the lukewarm church, is that you are neither cold. What do we mean by Cold refreshing and pure, and you're neither hot, passionate, 
on fire, zealous for the gospel anymore. See, cold and hot in this context are two good things. The problem is it's the lukewarm church. You're neither pure or refreshing, and you're neither soothing or hot or passionate for the kingdom of God anymore, and I can have nothing to do with you. You're lukewarm. You've grown apathetic to the things of God. Nothing gets you excited anymore. There's no passion. There's no vigor. There's nothing refreshing about you. There's no, nothing distinct about you. You've lost your passion for the gospel, your passion for uh, reconciling people, your, the, your passion for renewal, your passion for missions, your passion for reaching the lost and for serving the least of these. You've lost your passion. You've lost your sense of what it means to be distinctively the church on the one hand, that cold, refreshing water and that that fire and that passion. You're neither hot nor cold. And Jesus says, because you're lukewarm, that's the symptom of their illness. They've lost their passion. They lost their refreshing sense. And they had become the lukewarm church. They lack zeal. They lost vision. They lost passion. This was a church in Laodicea that was at sleep. They were asleep. This is the type of church that sleeps during the sermon. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But seriously, this is a church that can walk in and they can sing the songs, they can listen, they can take notes, but you're lost. You're thinking about a hundred different things and we've all been there at some point in our life. There's people in this room right now that's thinking about the grocery list, they're thinking about their son, they're thinking about their daughter, they're thinking about their marriage, they're thinking about everything other than just being here and fully engaged in worship. And that's what would happen with the church of Laodicea. They profess Jesus, they believed in Jesus. You notice in here in the church of Laodicea, unlike the other churches, there was no synagogue of Satan, right? I feel like we've read about the synagogue of Satan every week. There's no synagogue of Satan. There's no Roman opposition. There's no real deep heresy happening in the church of Laodicea. There is nothing externally that is happening to the church of Laodicea. What's the problem? It's all internal. It's the only church where it's internal. There's no synagogue of Satan, no opposition, no emperor worship, no heretical teaching. The problem was internal. This was a church that on the outward looked like they were alive and had a lot of stuff. They were wealthy and prosperous and had amazing provisions for them, but inwardly, they were lost. It's interesting, I read a stat a couple weeks ago, no surprise that, I've mentioned it before, America is the wealthiest nation in the world. The stat that I didn't realize is that there's no nation in the world that uses antidepressants more than America. America uses more antidepressants than all of the nations of the world combined. The most prosperous, wealthiest nation in the world, the nation that has everything, is the most depressed nation in the world. Oh God, would you wake us up? Would you wake up a church to be on fire, a passionate, zealot, zealous for the gospel, for the mission of the people of God? Take us out of the lukewarmness. Lukewarmness was the symptom for the illness. But let's dive a little deeper. If that was the symptom, what actually produced this illness? If this was a church, the church of Laodicea, that was sick, that was lukewarm, and we see the lukewarmness as this symptom, what actually led to this illness? How did they get this way? Well, we find the verse and we find the answer in verse 17. What does it say? For you say, I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing. That's it. You see, the problem, what led to the illness of the church of Laodicea is they had gotten so much, so much provision, so many resources that they eventually grew indifferent and apathetic to the things of God. They had so much that they began to, act, begin, they began to actually wonder, do I really need Jesus? Do I really need him? In fact, what does Jesus say? He says, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Because Jesus understood that the more you have, the temptation will always be to become less and less dependent upon Jesus. The church only had to see in verse 17, Jesus says, you've got everything. He he calls he calls calls them right out. You're rich, you have wealth, and you don't think you need anything. In fact, though, what? He goes on to say, you're wretched, poor, and blind. 
Outwardly, you look like a church that hasn't made. Wealth and success and prosperity and provision, but inwardly, you profess Jesus, but inwardly, you're a wretched mess inside. Case in point, I heard of a guy that was a young up and coming doctor, already very successful uh, by the age, uh, by, by the time he turned uh, 36. And he moved to central Florida and he visited a local church. And as it was customary, the following week, the pastor would take the visitor out to lunch and the pastor's taking this young up and coming doctor out to lunch. And the pastor explains Christianity to the doctor in a way that he had never thought about Christianity before. And the doctor says, this young doctor says, that's amazing. I have never heard Christianity presented that way. That is so helpful. And the pastor says, well, do you believe? Would you, would you like to accept Jesus? Would you like to follow him? And the doctor says, what, are you kidding me? No. He says, I, I, I'm glad I know this for that point in my life where I, when I'll really be desperate for him. Because this message, pastor, is for the, it's for the down and out. It's for the guy. It's for the addict left in the gutter. It's the, for the person that's the, at the end of the rope. It's the person that has no more options. And the pastor said, something came over me. <laughs> a boldness and a courageous time in my life where I leaned over and, I, and he said, sir, with all due respect, you need this gospel more than the addict in the gutter. You need this gospel more than the person that's at the end of their rope. You might look successful on the outside, but you are a wreck inside. And with that, the doctor professed to believe in Jesus Christ and became a Christian. Well, years later, time had passed and the pastor and the doctor had grown distant. And the doctor was wondering, the pastor was wondering, I wonder what ever happened to that doctor. And so he Googled his name, expecting to hear about all of the accolades and all of the successes. And the first thing that came up was his obituary. He died at 42 of pancreatic cancer. Coleridge, what we do matters. What we do matters here to give South Florida and the world the hope that there is something more. There is something more important than what this world has to offer. What we do and what we say and our mission here matters. It is important. Amen. Amen. It's your only hope and it's the only hope of our world. And the day we stop believing that we are poor and we are blind and we are wretched, we will become the lukewarm church. May we be a church that is always passionately desperate, utterly dependent upon Jesus Christ so that we might remind each other and that the whole world, the whole watching world might always know that there is only one hope and his name is Jesus Christ. So if lukewarmness was the symptom and if the illness that led to this symptom was their lack of dependence upon Christ, then what is the cure? It says in verse 18, Jesus says, I counsel you. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. And he says, I counsel you. Here's the cure. You've bought from the world your whole life and you think that's the answer. But here's the cure. I want you to buy from me. Because I have gold refined by fire so that you might really be rich and white garments so that you might clothe yourself from nakedness and your shame so that you might not be seen and solved to anoint your eyes so that you might see. What Jesus is saying is instead of buying that lie from the world that as I said a few weeks ago that always promises but never delivers, instead I counsel you to buy from me so that you would realize that everything you need and only everything you need can only be found in me. The wealth you long for, the covering of your shame, the cure to your blindness can only be found in Jesus Christ. Jesus even goes on to say these garments of, of white. What are the garments of white here that Jesus offers? The garments of white all throughout the Bible are always synonymous with righteousness. What Jesus is saying is I have a righteousness that you cannot purchase for yourself. 
that we live in a world that is always trying to make things right, making things right in our life and with our family and with our spouses. And ultimately, whether we realize it or not, we are always trying to make our lives right with God. And he said, you can't get it from this world and you can't get it on your own. Only through buying it through me, Jesus Christ, can you have the garments of white. And see, the message of the good news this morning is that Jesus stands there and he says, buy for me. And the only reason he is able to say that I have something that the world cannot deliver on is because Jesus himself, the reason he's able to say, I can give you riches is because the message of the gospel tells us that Jesus became poor. The only way he can tell us that he has garments that will clothe our nakedness and our shame is because Jesus himself became naked on the cross and took on our shame. And the only reason he's able to say that you can now see is because Jesus was blinded by the, from the Father, totally shut off from him, where God, Jesus could no longer sense the real presence of God in his life anymore from the cross. You see, that is the message of good news for you and me. That is why Jesus is the only cure. That's why we say we exist to be a gospel-centered church because in every facet of life, that is the only answer. It is the only key. That Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, became poor so that you might become rich, became blind so that you might see, became naked and took on our shame so that you might forever be clothed by the righteousness of God. But you know what's even better good news? Where is Jesus standing? Is Jesus standing on this, you know, pie in the sky sermon in the clouds up in heaven saying, come to me and buy from me riches and wealth and, and solve for your eyes and garments of righteousness. You have to come to me. No. What's it say in verse 20? Where is Jesus standing? It says in verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Christianity is the only message in the world. Every philosophy, every religion, every worldview that says that you do not have to go to God to buy what you need and what you desire, but that God through the person of Jesus Christ comes down to you. And it says he's standing at the door and he's knocking. And the good news is that this man who is standing at the door and knocking is not some homeless traveler that is looking for a place to lie his head down tonight. This is the husband that has come back for his wayward bride. It is his house. It is his bride behind that door. And Jesus says, I come standing, knocking to repossess and reclaim and rescue that which was lost, that which was mine. And my whole life, I used to think the critical part of this verse was who will let Jesus in? No, the critical part of this verse, do not miss it, is that Jesus is the one that is pursuing. Jesus is the one that is initiating. Jesus is the one that is standing at the door and knocking, that it is his sovereign grace, his sovereign pursuit of his bride that has abandoned him. He's the pursuer. He's the great lover that has come back for his bride. I love this story of a woman. And I love this story because it was, it's so raw and so real. This woman married for 10 years, three kids. And one day she just snapped. She got tired of the bedtime and the bath time and the diapers and the peanut butter being stuck to all the furniture. And she just one day just got up and left, left her husband and left her kids. She just couldn't take it anymore. And so the husband tracked her down. He started looking at every credit card receipt and his statement, and he started looking at all, every phone bill. And after six weeks found that she had been living in a hotel 90 miles away. And then came the knock of the door. The husband knocks on the door and the wife opens the door and when she sees who is behind that door, she falls to her knees. She cannot believe that the husband she abandoned actually came for her. Guess what? That's the whole good news that we believe in. That we have run, some of us have run way further than 90 miles and we run and we run and there's some in this room that if you have run your whole life thinking that there is something out there and the good news of the gospel is that Jesus doesn't quit. 
that he stands at the door and he knocks. Some of you believe, some of you profess, but there is a season going on in your life that only you and God know about that you are running, thinking there's something better, something more glorious, something more satisfying. And guess what? The good news is that Jesus today stands at the door and he knocks. He pursues his wayward bride. Jesus doesn't abandon. And even better news for those that are in this room that feel abandoned, abandoned by a spouse, abandoned by a friend, abandoned by the promises and the expectations of life and everything this life had to offer, guess what? In the person of Jesus Christ, we have the promise of one who will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus doesn't abandon. And the invitation for you this morning, and the invitation for you this morning is all you have to do is let him in and see that your life will be more satisfied and more fulfilled than you could ever hope for or imagine. He has bought you the life that you could have never bought for yourself. And guess how he did it? By laying down his own life for you. Coral Ridge, let's be that church. Let's be a church that burns with a passion for Jesus because we know the truth that Jesus burns with a passion for you.